Same thing happened at Pasig. You know, uh, is right. We hired uh, Bear. What was Bear's real name? Anybody remember? Oh, well. Steve. Yeah, yeah. So there, you know, there was there, 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 there was a Pasig cop, and he was a good guy, and uh, we hired him, and uh, he kept everything cool uh, with the police, uh, except. See, you're right. Good for you. Steve on tell. He the lottery three times. What? He the lottery three times. Really? That's five million dollars total. God bless him. God bless him. So, but we had, but we, we continued to have this really terrible problem with a couple of city councilmen. Um, a guy named Bruce. His last name was Bruce. You can't remember his first name. Pete. Pete. Okay. And he, they were always trying to run us out of town. Always trying to run us out of town. You know, same thing. Hippies, drugs. Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the Rolling Stones came and played the Capitol. And uh, they, we closed down, you know, they, well, let's say forward, but we closed down Monroe Street, which was, a, the police did, our friends the police then, you know, barricaded it because, you know, it was 3,500 or whatever people and there were 10,000 people, maybe more, that, that came, to, you know, to, 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 to try to see the show. So um, all the networks sent crews out. So in those days, there probably were only four or five. Uh, stick, but, you know, there were, there were, you know, like three, four, five uh, um, trucks. Uh, trucks there, you know, shooting and stuff. And so I remember I'm being out in front of the marquee, talking, you know, talking to our crew and, you know, talking to the kids, keeping the, keeping the kids didn't have tickets, you know, sort of calm as best I could. And all of a sudden, a couple of guys start walking towards me from about a block away. And there's two cops and then two plain clothes guys. I couldn't quite tell who they were. C parted. They walked through. There's this guy, Pete Bruce. All right? Camera's rolling. John! We're so proud to have you here. The Capitol is a great institution. It's just, it's just wonderful. It proves that, you know, that, that the new generation can get along with the old generation. He was as full of shit as anybody had ever been, but he got himself on the, on, on the 6 o'clock news. Uh, so, uh, you know, little by little over the years, we, we, and mostly because of the crew guys, we, we, uh, we tamed the cops. You know, we tamed the cops. So, uh, uh, we also have uh, Glenn Partridge here, who also worked with John. Is uh, Glenn? Uh... Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Glenn will talk a little later, but um, are there any questions or comments anyone would like to make? Yes. Yeah. If it wasn't for Ken Viola, I wouldn't be here tonight because Kenny was the one that called me up when I was a junior at Rhode Island School of Design in 1978 and said, Arlen, uh, John Cher wants to have a special marquee design for the Capitol Theater and do you want to do the artwork? And I said, well, let me check my schedule and see if I can fit that in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, not only... Um, doing that give me one of the greatest nights of my life and experience I still relive when I describe and talk to people about it but one of the greatest tributes I want to give to John is that when I stepped into that Capitol Theater the, that first night September 19th this was uh, 1978 this was before the video age and there were in concerts being shown on video screens and I remember coming to the Capitol Theater and seeing these two big square white screens, they weren't rectangles, they were squares. And they were on the side of the stage. The Capitol Theater wasn't a big venue. And I remember looking at those things going, what are those for? And, you know, and, and of course, you know, but what's great about it is that John, I think, was at the forefront of documenting things on video before anybody even knew what the word video was. And that show of September 19th that was radio broadcast ended up becoming what many of us feel is the single greatest night of Bruce Springsteen's career. But what's brilliant about that is that when we talk about rock and roll history and the great shows like Bob Dylan at the Royal Albert Hall, there's
there's no real film document of that. And the fact that John was prescient enough to capture these shows on this primitive art form of video is something that now, 30 plus years later, when we talk about the single greatest night in Bruce Springsteen's life, thanks to John, there is a video document of that entire show that exists for the rest of the world to see when you want to talk to people now about how great Bruce was in his prime, thanks to John, that entire show has been documented, and that's something for rock and roll history that we really owe uh, John's foresight um, a real, and I owe him because it was one of the single greatest nights in my life. So thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you how how really that came about. And 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 and. Uh, um, when we first opened the Capitol, um, we said the Fillmore had closed six months before, and I agree with what I think Kenny said. I mean, it was, you know, for me, for a lot of us, those two and a half or three years that the Fillmore existed was, you know, fantasy land. It was, you know, unbelievable. And, and Bill Graham was a great showman, there's no question about it. Um, and uh, um, an uh, artist, a um, very creative guy named Joshua White, had created the Joshua Light Show. And, uh, you know, those of you that can remember that, because everything that came sort of by the late 70s or, or early 80s, when you've ever seen, when technology got bad, better, the light shows got worse. All right? uh, and they were liquid light shows. So behind the screen uh, at the Fillmore, in front of the screen with us, there was, uh, you know, liquid colors and various different you know, clocks and things like that. And because, again, the, the, the crew was of the music and of the time, the things that were going on on the screen you know, kept up with the music and they were great. But as lighting, uh, the technology and lighting became more sophisticated and more sophisticated, the light shows didn't work anymore on the screen. They got, they, you know, they, they, they got flooded out with, with lights. So we always wanted to do something a little bit special. And uh, uh, so we bought uh, two, uh, n n you know, newly invented, two new black and white, that's why all these shows are, almost all these shows are in black and white, uh, projectors, put up these screens. And um, pretty much internally, Moisey can probably fill in better than I can, but. Uh, a guy named Harold Klein and, and Moisey and um, um, you know a, a number of other people sort of created you know this ability to both have the stage lighting work brilliantly and have these screens and what was the purpose of the screens? Well first of all while the Capitol was small in those early years it was actually pretty big because there really weren't any arena shows uh, at the time. But I remember, you know, one of the reasons Jeff Beck was gonna was gonna play the Capitol, and you know, I remember saying to whoever, uh, wouldn't it be cool if the audience could like really see a close up of Jeff Beck playing the guitar, all right? And so it became a staple of the Capitol and Asbury Park and Roosevelt Stadium, and uh, a lot of that stuff exists on the black market. I lost control of it, um, but. Uh, you know, it was one of the things that made the Capitol special because nobody else was doing that. Moise, did I get this even half right? You got it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. There's a picture here someplace of the marquee. Um, you know. Um, okay, so I'll look at it. I don't know if everyone could hear that, but the question was about the Clash uh, playing Convention Hall. Um, look, at Convention Hall, you know, once the sort of modern era of rock came about, um, first the casino and then and then uh, uh, Convention Hall, it, it became a destination for people turned out all over the world. Come to Asbury Park. This is way before Bruce was a big act, all right? Um, 
you know, it became a place that was intimate. Um, in my lifetime, convention hall was never very pretty. Uh, was it so in it was, yeah, what? Wasn't it in decline for a while? Well, yeah, I mean, it's still in decline. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, at, at, you know but, but, but it, again, it was sort of ours. You know, sound wasn't great. Capital, capital sound was great. Um, but, uh, um, so, you know, I, I got turned on to the Clash, you know, very, very early. And this goes back to Frank Barcelona and Premier Talent. You know, they were booking the Clash and they wanted to start that tour in some place where they were really confident there would be real rock and roll fans there. Really people, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that appreciated and, 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 and knew their music. And now, is this the London Calling tour? No, 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 no. Combat Rock. Oh, Combat Rock, okay. Right. okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of the word went out from Premier, put forth what you think meets this criteria. And uh, I put forth Asbury and uh, went and had a meeting about it, and uh, they agreed to do it, and they were three pretty amazing nights. You know, I, 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 I think I might have said before, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember what I did half an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they were one of the greatest rock and roll bands ever. They, they, they were extraordinary. Go back and listen to the records. I mean, uh, they just didn't stay together long enough to, to, uh, um, to have the impact that I think that they, that they deserve. I mean, and they did it all. They were great rock band, but they were also, they were hit, they were hit singles. Uh, so uh, that's how it happened. I, 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 convinced, I convinced them it was the right thing to do. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they rented out the amusement casino. Right. And then it was a private invitation only. I, you know, I remember that, but I don't know whose idea. Well, I have to thank you because <laughs> it was really my first professional photography gig. Right. I got guest list all three nights and the party. And I had met Cosmo at Electric Ladyland in New York, showed him my portfolio. The strummer was there, still mixing down the album. Right. That's great. I want to thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe a couple more questions if you want. Yeah. Trivia for the audience. What was the last Roosevelt Stadium gig, and it ended on a bit of a dark note? Last show? Well, no. I mean, one of them ended. Well, it didn't really end in a dark note. I mean, I mean, there, 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 CSNY? Yes, yes. And, a, and, a, and a kid from Union got stabbed at the end of the night. I think that was the last gig. Because yeah. Giant that, Stadium opened the next year. Yeah. Actually, Roosevelt Stadium. No, no, I'm saying Giant Stadium opened the next year. That's when we stopped doing oh, right, stuff at Roosevelt right. Stadium. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that now that you say it. Yeah, I mean, the, mo the most uh, uh, famous shows from Roosevelt were... Um, uh, well, the most famous, I think, was the night Richard Nixon resigned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, because Nash and Young, uh, and he resigned. He actually resigned when he when when they were on stage and we were backstage listening, you know, to uh, to the radio. Maybe we were even watching TV. I don't know. Uh, and I walked up on stage in the middle of the song and leaned over to, to Graham Nash and and told him. And uh, we had a, it was a very hairy week before that because historically that's where the where America was going. He was going to get impeached or he was going to resign and the mayor of Jersey City who was a good guy, um, uh, first good guy, that did, probably the first mayor that didn't go to jail in, in, in decades <laughs> in, 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 in Jersey City, uh, jo Dr. Jordan, I don't remember his first name, and then his, his chief of staff was a guy named Art Dello. Both good guys, really embraced rock and roll. Um, we had a few really great years there. They freaked out over the possibility of CSNNY playing on an, on, in, in that atmosphere because it was, uh, you know, it was an era where, uh, um, and, and 
it's sort of hard for people who didn't live through that to understand it. It was, it was an era that sociologically, you know, the, the baby boomer generation was unquestionably rebelling. All right, and Kent State had happened, uh, and um, so you know they felt that if we put this show on, this one didn't end up in court, but if we put this show on, you know that there would be hundreds of thousands of people there. Um, and so when the when the show came, uh, the mayor and his chief of staff and the police were unbelievably uptight, afraid. And there were a few thousand people in the parking lots. There's no question about it. You know, maybe 5,000. Um, but it was a celebratory thing because at the time it was gotcha, Nixon. And and so I walked up on stage and I told Graham Nash, and uh, they were in the middle of a song. They finished the song. He walked over to the other guys. All told them. Uh, and they went into, uh, if I remember this correctly, um, they announced it. Audience went crazy. Cops were, were ordered by the mayor to throw the doors open. So instead of keeping them outside this fortress, because Roosevelt oh Stadium God. was a fortress, mm -hmm. all right, they let them in. So another 5,000 or 10,000 people came in. Could have been very dangerous. Uh, and uh, CSNY went into a long time coming, and then Ohio. And, you know, the, the, the hair on the back of my neck stands up to this moment, you know, uh, saying that. And it was, you know, it was a victory. We had won, you know. Now, look, there was a lot of ugly shit that happened after Nixon resigned, you know. But, uh, um, you know, it was, it was an extraordinary night. And there were a bunch of extraordinary things that happened. I mean, there's a great Alice Cooper story. Alice Cooper um, put out an album. I'm forgetting the name of it. Somebody here will know. Yes, with, with, the, with the panties with, that had the oh, panties in yeah. yeah. it? you know? School's out. School's out, okay. So, you know, they had paper panties that were sealed into the album, all right? So Alice is playing Roosevelt Stadium, and, uh, and, uh, what? John Sackley. Was the MC? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, these guys all have better memories than I do. Uh, and they were all stumped, too. Uh, the pain straight's not all, not, not all, all, all in, uh, in